The third panel that we will hear from today uh, consists of Seal Prinster of the Colorado Enterprise Fund, uh, Roberto Barragan of Valley Economic Development Center, Clarence Williams of California Capital Financial Development Corporation, Alan Fisher of the California Reinvestment Coalition, Preeti Bisa of the Greenlining Institute, and Joan Ling of the Community Corporation of Santa Monica presenting for the Low Income Housing Institute. And with those brief introductions, let me uh, ask Ms. Prinster to begin. Thank you very much. On behalf of Colorado Enterprise Fund, I appreciate the opportunity to engage in the discussion on modernizing the Community Reinvestment Act. Colorado Enterprise Fund is a CDFI that has been helping small businesses across the state of Colorado for nearly 35 years. We provide access to affordable, flexible loan capital and, and offer advisory services to build the management capacity of business owners and entrepreneurs. Our goal is to provide economic opportunity to low and moderate income individuals by cattling business formation and growth as the economic engine for healthy communities in our state. The CRA overall has fostered community and economic development well, supporting countless organizations, strategies, and initiatives um, in addition to lending. It has helped create economic opportunity by connecting underserved markets with financial capital and services. I will be discussing CRA as it relates to the needs of small business, since this is the area in which I work and which I believe needs increased focus. The current economic crisis, which started as an implosion in the home mortgage market, has now become a calamity for small businesses, which are the mainstay of jobs and economic vitality in this country, and I believe CRA can do more to help address this calamity. In addition, these conversations about CRA should dovetail with the findings of a series of over 40 meetings held across the country this year by the Federal Reserve on addressing the financing needs of small business, which identified issues that have impacted the supply of credit to small business. When the bar for safety and soundness of lending is, to small business is raised so high as to make it impossible to get a loan, economic development is halted. Both sides of the House need to be talking to each other so that different government stakeholders are not sending conflicting messages, as has been experienced in the current environment. The Federal Reserve Small Business Meetings identified credit gaps that updated CRA policies could help address, such as the need for lines of credit and working capital, refinancing maturing loans, small dollar loans under 200000 patient capital for business needs that take time to generate revenues for debt service, and loans to distressed industries like construction, retail, and service businesses. Also, startup capital is almost impossible to obtain, but in high demand, as unemployed workers want to launch new businesses. One possibility for addressing some of these credit gaps is to give CRA credit for SBA 7A loans of any amount in the same way that SBA 504 loans over a million already are eligible for CRA. Tracking data on all SBA 7A lending and incorporating it into CRA evaluations would foster increased business lending for working capital, business startups and acquisitions, and certain debt restructures. The SBA guarantee provides safety for the bank while helping the business obtain loan capital. Nevertheless, there will still be gaps. Businesses that are denied credit or perceive that they will be denied will turn to alternative sources of capital that are not optimal for sustained economic development, such as using credit cards and retirement accounts, adjusting terms on receivables and payables, and using expensive factoring. CDFIs present the option of patient, responsible, and flexible business capital, successfully executing loans perceived as high risk, and providing access to capital in times of economic turbulence. Colorado Enterprise Fund has numerous successful bank partnerships with national, regional, and small community banks that have provided us with the investment capital for loans to small businesses for many years. Our bank partners see these investments as an efficient means of reaching markets or populations that are difficult for them to serve due to various economic and regulatory constraints, especially in limited scope markets where they have a smaller presence. While banks have been a critical partner of CDFIs, a modern CRA would encourage financial institutions to expand their investments in CDFIs 
By giving these partnerships more weight through data collection and factoring CDFI relationships more heavily into performance evaluations. A new CRA should also promote innovative approaches to CDFI partnerships by giving banks CRA credit for new financing strategies while still continuing their long-term investments in CDFIs. An example of an effective new strategy that could be adapted in this context is the Colorado Credit Reserve, which is a capital access program that has provided a resource to fund uh, loan losses and has helped us leverage these dollars by a factor of over 15 to 1 for the benefit of small businesses. This impact could be replicated as a CRA strategy for banks to employ more broadly in support of CDFIs. The need for technical assistance and business advisory service is an area that could use more emphasis in a revitalized CRA. Homeownership counseling is an accepted and widely supported service identified in CRA recommendations. Technical assistance to businesses will help them prepare for bank financing and long-term viability, thus promoting sustained economic development. CRA could develop mechanisms to support CDFIs and other community resources who provide business TA. Thank you for holding these meetings and for allowing me to comment from my perspective as a CDFI supporting small business. I believe that uh, there's great potential for en enhancing the CRA regulations to uh, provide sustained economic development, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barragan. My name is uh, Roberto Barragan. I am President and CEO of VDC, the Valley Economic Development Center. On behalf of VEDC, I appreciate this opportunity to provide comment on strengthening and modernizing the Community Reinvestment Act. VEDC is the largest small business development organization in metropolitan Los Angeles, serving over 6,000 businesses annually with direct lending, technical assistance, training, and workshops. VEDC is a certified community development finance institution with an existing $15 million small micro business loan portfolio and recently, recently secured capital for, from the City of Los Angeles and Goldman Sachs to support another $21 million in small business lending. VEDC is a small business administration micro lender for over 12 years and operates the largest economic development administration revolving loan fund in California. We are also the sponsor of a federally chartered low income credit union with $2.4 million in assets and ranks in the top 75 of SBA lenders here in Los Angeles. And lastly, VDC has an affiliate that does SBA 504 lending. Over the last 24 months, VDC has been at the epicenter of the worst small business credit crisis since the Great Depression. SBA lending has dropped 50% over that time, and large national commercial banks that led small business lending for loans below $100,000 and who suffered millions in losses due to stated income loans have walked away from the market, leaving huge gaps in credit availability. At the same time, small business watched as the home equity lines, credit lines, and lines of credit that they depended upon were terminated. Finally, here in Los Angeles, regional business banks, those responsible for supporting small and medium businesses are facing millions of losses due to commercial real estate failures. After two years of recession, startup capital is non-existent and existing small business lending by national banks is limited to business credit cards and loans above $200,000. With 60% of California banks under some type of regulatory control, many banks cannot make small business, small business loans or have to limit them to relatively um, risk-free real estate financing at 50% loan to value. Just as we have seen the long-term unemployed stop looking for jobs, we also see now see small business stop looking for capital. As existing businesses come out of the recession and seek to become part of the sputtering recovery, they have given up looking for capital, tired of loan denials, and while they have real expansion possibilities, rather than borrow to support growth, they grow organically from profits. So rather than job creation in the desperately needed tens and hundreds, we have job creations in the ones and twos. Finally, federal efforts to encourage small business lending either depend on those same banks who are under regulatory control or have suffered huge credit losses or seek, banks to have bank, or seek to have banks borrow for them, from them at low rates, seem, seemingly unconscious of the fact that capital is at risk when loans are made. Cheap money does not tempt more small business lending. It funds additional large business and real estate lending. To strengthen and modernize CRA to the benefit of small business, I, I would ask, um, eliminate Regulation B and the bank's ability to meet CRA small business lending benchmarks through credit cards and other revolving debt. Loans below $100,000 and to businesses with revenues under $1 million are, not, are no longer adequate indicators of either small business lending or lending to minorities. Doctors, dentists, and other professionals with net incomes much greater than most small businesses have benefited from this loophole, not small business, which by every economist's forecast will be the source of jobs to come. 
Transparency should be the minimum requirement of all any, not the exception. We must accept the fact that bank-based solutions to our small business credit crunch ignores their own plight and encourages rhetoric rather than action. Accordingly, federal as well as bank support to direct lending mechanisms, such as CDFIs, must receive continuous and higher support. In addition, the regulatory, regulating agency should work with the CDFI fund to target support not to just in, national intermediaries, but to the communities suffering the brunt of this credit crisis, such as in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Over the last five years, 75% of CDFI financial assistance has been awarded east of the Mississippi, blind to both the growth of these communities as well as the downturn they have experienced. Banks should also be challenged to make real and transparent investments uh, in distressed communities as opposed to capitulating to CRA extortionists and for-profit for wolf funds masquerading in CRA sheepskin. CRA investments should result in jobs created for low and moderate income residents, not profits for real estate investment corporations that use CRA to garner investments they can't, they can't raise otherwise. These for-profits should not be allowable community investments. Short term, a recent Pepperdine study highlights much of what I have spoken to today. The current ability of small business to grow and hire, and their critical and current inability to do so without capital. We have waited over two years for recovery to come and small business lending to come back. By all indications, we have another 12 to 20, 18 months before we see some new normal. With 14% unemployment here in LA, we cannot wait that, that long. We need capital now, we need small business growth now, and we need new jobs now. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the future and importance of the CRA. Thank you. Mr. Williams? <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Clarence Williams, and I am President and CEO of California Capital Financial Development Corporation. California Capital is a nonprofit CDFI organization located in Sacramento, California. We have provided financing, business development training, financial literacy education, and technical assistance for small and micro uh, enterprise businesses since 1983. With a 27-year uh, history of aiding underserved communities, we enjoy an exemplary reputation throughout Northern California and the Central Valley. Historically, the Community Reinvestment Act has attempted to address discrimination in loans made to individuals and businesses from low and moderate income communities. Today, I am here to advocate for the immediate promulgation of regulations, adopting the provisions of the Dodd-Frank Bill of 2010 that requires lenders to report race and gender of borrowers of small business loans. The census tract location of the business, action taken with respect to the application approved or rejected, and the revenue of the business. With a fast-growing minority population that will approach 50% of the nation's population by 2050, in a highly competitive global market, America's competitiveness will increasingly depend on the innovation and strength of minority business enterprises. It is in the best interest of the health of our economy that regulators require financial institutions to collect data that will tell the story of lending activity to small, minority, and women-owned businesses. This will serve as a catalyst to mitigate disparate lending outcomes to those businesses. As an example, we know that entrepreneurs who use credit cards to start and acquire their businesses may be exposed to higher operating costs because credit cards tend to charge, on average, higher interest rates compared to other sources of capital. Firms started by using credit cards for capital are usually at a cost disadvantage compared to firms that were started with other sources of capital. Accordingly, a national study completed in 2007 by the Insight Center for Community Economic Development found that entrepreneurs of color are more likely to turn to credit card debt as a way to finance business startup, an expensive and risky financing mechanism. Their data shows 19% of white males receive business loans from banks as opposed to only 9% Hispanic and African-American business owners. Furthermore, regulatory agencies need to collect the following data. Loans, uh, loans less than $250,000 and between $251,000 and $500,000 to businesses with revenues of $1 million or less annually. Loans that compare overall small business lending to the proportion of lending to small women-owned and minority-owned businesses in low-income neighborhoods, as well as the overall amount of lending. Annual percentage rate of loans, identification of term loans, and lines of credit as well as interest rates. It is also important to emphasize the access to business advisory services, including technical assistance and financial literacy education for low and moderate income individuals and business owners is severely lacking. Small and microenterprise businesses have an enhanced opportunity of realizing success and sustainability 
if there is greater access to these services. Finally, attention and resources should be directed to the needs of the high growth immigrant, refugee, and limited non-English proficient business market. These recommendations that I have set forth today are an attempt to correct for past and present discrimination and to prevent such from reoccurring in the future. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Mr. Fisher? Thank you. Is it possible to borrow some of his time in the... Uh... <laughs> no. All right. We can negotiate. All right. um, good afternoon. Thank you for, um, for inviting me. I'm Alan Fisher, Executive Director of the California Reinvestment Coalition. CRC is a statewide membership organization of more than 280 nonprofits, public agencies working around CRA and um, banking and finance issues for more than a couple decades. And CRA has really opened the door for community organizations. I think that's one of the things that really needs to be put out there. I mean, I, I have friends, not close friends, but friends who work for, you know, big funds, and they can't meet with the CEO. We meet with the CEO, and that's something that only could have happened with CRA. But at the same time, I, I really want to speak to the four of you and your agencies because you let us down in the last five or ten years. You could have stopped some of this. We asked you to look at subsidiaries and affiliates. We asked you to look at small business, all of these things. And we really need you to be regulators, to not let this happen to our country again. So I hope that you'll hear that. I think one of the things that we hope is that you'll really listen to the community more than you have before. Um, we may be biased in this, but it seemed like the bank spoke louder than we did at any of the agencies. Um, I think one piece of this is community context. Just to give you an example, we met once in Washington, D.C. with the OCC, maybe 12 or 15 leaders from California, and I just, we were talking about community context, and I just happened to ask, unrehearsed, no one in that room had had a community contact from one of your agencies to ask about the banks. And these are leaders in the community. So I really hope that can change. I hope that you'll listen to the community more. I hope that we can avoid having another crisis like this. The, I just, I'm going to try not to repeat things that others have said, my, my colleagues, about small business. But, but I think there are a couple quick things on geographic coverage. One is, if there's a bank that has one branch or a few and that lends across the country, they need to be responsible in the area where they do significant lending. My favorite example of this was Countrywide Bank that in my neighborhood said Countrywide Bank and Mortgage, and yet you know, they had no responsibility for deposits that they collected. No responsibility in San Francisco, which is probably not an underserved community in Great Park. But the other thing is that non-metropolitan and rural areas are too often overlooked. I mean, what banks are telling community groups is that these areas are not in their, quote, CRA lending areas, unquote. And I think you bear responsibility for that as well, not all of it. But you need to not do sampling. You need to look at rural areas. What's happening is that areas that already have very little are being even further left alone. Um, to me, if a bank maybe is too large to fully evaluate, maybe it uh, presents systemic risk and shouldn't exist at that size. Um, so CRA performance tests, CRA's goal is equal access. I think banks should be evaluated on how closely they approach equality in their lending investments and services. I mean, are they providing products that serve low-income people and people of color? Too often what we see, and my staff tells me this is a dated reference, but um, are one-size-fits-all that are, would be great for Ozzie and Harriet. And looking at this audience, maybe people do know Ozzie and Harriet. But, um, and not for people with less income, not for people with different cultures. Secondly, does the proportion of lending service investments match the proportion of the population? I mean, I would say it never does, but are they approaching that? Is it getting there? Are the branches matching the population? Because managers of branches get judged on whether they serve their area. If there's no branch, there's nobody worrying about that neighborhood. And it's clear from every study that color prejudice is alive and well, and CR examinations need to have a greater evaluation of disparate impact. Um, we agree with a recent report from the California Small Business Task Force convened by this bank in its recommendation that requiring any acquirer of regulation, regu regulated misprint, financial institutions to agree to honor any existing publicly announced community reinvestment agreement or plan. 
We think it's a great disservice to communities that one bank after another has merged and there's no public comment. You know, we now have four banks in the state of California that have 60% of the deposits in the state of California. That means that it's very difficult to control those banks. Just, I want to support what my colleagues here said about Dodd-Frank. We wish you would implement those features immediately and about entities, businesses with less than a million dollars, they ought to be looked at. Um, we hope that um, you will maybe use the community in terms of community development. We sometimes think that the examiners really don't understand that. My favorite example from uh, a few years back was an evaluation where they said that it was okay that branches were closed in low-income areas because e-banking was being offered. So just to, to close, I think that there need to be public hearings on any merger but also, I hope that if there are some folks who maybe didn't make it in five days ahead of time in their request for public comment, that they could be added. The last time this happened in the 90s, there were two days, and it wasn't so rushed. So I appreciate this. We're looking forward to continuing dialogue. Thank you. Right. Um, Ms. Visa. Sure. Uh, the Green Lighting Institute thanks the federal agencies for this timely review of CRA and for the opportunity to contribute to the discussion of such an important issue. As I speak, we are witnessing an unprecedented loss of wealth in communities of color across the nation. A leading reason for this loss of wealth is the growing loss of home equity. According to the Center for Responsible Lending, widespread foreclosures have drained an estimated $350 billion from communities of color. For every 100 African American homeowners, 11 have either lost their homes or are at risk of foreclosure. For Latino families, the figures are worse. That comes to 17 of every 100 homeowners are touched by foreclosure. While foreclosures, of course, are a key part of the picture, they are certainly not the whole picture. Beyond losing their homes, people in our communities have been the last hired and first fired and have lost a disproportionate number of small businesses. This has led to a growing racial wealth gap. For every dollar of wealth owned by a white family, an African American or Latino family owns just 16 cents. And I'd love to show you that the same trends exist within the Asian American community, but of course we don't have the disaggregated data for that. The modernization and enhancement of CRA has the potential to address many of these inequalities, yet as it is written today, it lacks the power to truly do so. Despite the strengths of CRA, we know it can't be effective unless it is embraced and promoted by regulators and financial institutions. We're therefore pleased that the federal regulators are proactively seeking input today through these hearings. Given the magnitude of the crisis facing communities, Greenlining recommends the following for immediate implementation. Number one, immediately place diversity front and center in the application of CRA. First and foremost, we must embrace the fact that diversity matters. CRA ratings must take into account the extent to which a financial institution commits to diversity in the workplace and among executive management. The 2009 Greenlining Annual Board Diversity Report shows that in California, people of color represent 60% of the population, yet corporate board structures are nowhere near that level of diversity. This is despite research from CalPERS that shows that diverse boards produce higher performance on metrics such as return on equity, return on sales, and return on invested capital. Unless and until the boards and executive management teams at financial institutions reflect the diversity of the customers they serve, we truly cannot have a safe and sound banking system. Number two, immediately add supplier diversity to the CRA evaluation process. The rapid hemorrhaging of jobs and assets in our communities can at least partially be addressed through better attention to the needs of minority-owned businesses. Small businesses are among the top job creators in low-income communities and communities of color, but many smaller minority-owned businesses face difficulty accessing the contracts that enable them to grow. An incredibly successful model in California, General Order 156, or GO 156, has placed California light years ahead of other states in minority business contracting. GO 156 has moved the supplier diversity of major utilities and telecoms in California to as high as 30%, while they hover around 5% in other states, through simple goal setting and transparency and without any quotas or mandates. This model should be replicated by the financial regulators. Under an enhanced CRA, banks should be required to submit annual reports on their supplier diversity numbers and to participate in an annual hearing to discuss their reports. Number three, create positive incentives for innovation. The current CRA system has never figured out how to reward unique leadership efforts, as was mentioned in the previous panel. We therefore see satisfactory ratings for occasionally extraordinary leadership 
or outstanding ratings for mediocre efforts. Banks should be able to receive CRA credit by meeting the needs of communities through responsible innovations. The return to conventional lending products should not preclude creative, innovative, and safe products that have less conventional terms and that respond to new trends in building community economic strength. Such innovation should be highlighted as best practices and rewarded with credit under a revised CRA. And fourth and finally, make CRA matter again. The world has changed since CRA was enacted in 1977, and its failure to keep up has diminished its effectiveness. We can make CRA matter again. The financial sector of that area would, era would be unrecognizable today, and many financial services critical to wealth creation are now provided by institutions not covered by CRA. A modernized CRA must be expanded to cover these other industries, including investment banks, insurance, hedge funds, private equity firms, and of course any troubled institution that benefits from federal intervention. Former Chairman Greenspan himself recently acknowledged that federal regulators were not proactive enough in protecting consumers from fraudulent practices by these industries. Given this new perspective, we urge the regulators to take initiative to expand the purview of CRA to these institutions. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity to share Greenlining's views on the future of CRA, and I welcome your questions, and I'm very glad I didn't hear that ding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you spoke fast enough. Uh, Ms. Ling. Good afternoon. My name is Joan Ling, Executive Director, Community Corporation of Santa Monica. I'm presenting this testimony on behalf of Sharon Lee of the Low Income Housing Institute in Seattle, Washington. Lehigh is a nonprofit housing organization. It has developed over 3,800 units of affordable housing in six counties in the Puget Sound region, from supportive housing for the homeless to for sale condominiums for moderate income families. As well, it advocates on housing policy, housing preservation, and homeless issues. For over 15 years, it coordinated the activities of the Washington Reinvestment Alliance to ensure that CRA commitments are honored in Washington State. Modernizing and improving CRA is sorely needed. The federal agencies must revamp the evaluation tools to clearly quantify the CRA benefits to low and moderate income communities and people of color. The system is flawed if 80 if 99% of the banks pass their CRA exam, yet low and moderate income consumers and communities of colors are not being adequately served. This is evidenced by the subprime loan foreclosure crisis, the proliferation of payday loans, and the lack of community development financing for nonprofit affordable housing developers. I'd like to address four issues related to small business and consumer lending. In the state of Washington in 2008, there were 250,000 small business loans made with a dollar amount of $6.6 .6 billion. The banks need to collect information separating out dollar volume and number of loans made to minority and women-owned small businesses, as well as identifying those loans made in distressed areas. Number two, banks should offer a range of consumer loan products that serve low-income and moderate-income borrowers. The federal agencies should establish benchmarks to assess the quantity, quality, and affordability of these products and ensure that low-cost banking accounts, financial education, and services to the unbanked are offered in the assessment areas. Number three, today pay lo payday loan offices are prevalent in low-income neighborhoods and they outperform mainstream banks in serving low-income families and individuals. The federal agencies must require banks to recommit and expand their operations, including locating branches, ATMs, home mortgage, and business centers in low-income and minority communities. Number four, in the state of Washington, an increasing number of Latino families with children are living in mobile, home, in mobile homes. These families are in need of an affordable loan product to purchase their homes, otherwise being subject to usurious high interest rate in the double digits. In the area of data collection, reporting, disclosure, and performance evaluations, we have three points that we would like to make. First, the Hamda information must include sufficient amount of, provides information on the quantities of the loans with reasonable terms to minority and low-income households. Lehigh recently completed 48 townhomes, 
for first-time buyers with modest means in the Seattle area. Some immigrant families, many with extensive savings and no debt, were put through the ringer in qualifying for home loans because they had no credit cards, no car loans, paid their bills on time, and therefore had no credit rating. They were initially rejected for loans. It's not acceptable for, minor for minority households with alternative credit to be treated this way. Number two, financing of affordable multifamily housing should be given as much if not more weight than single family loans because the bulk of the low income people are served by rental housing. Nonprofit developers in the Pacific Northwest are in particular need for fixed rate long term debt. In addition, we ask that land acquisition loans, working capitals, and EQ2 investments for affordable housing be a requirement in order to achieve CRA status, satisfactory rating. In the process of assessing a bank's performance under CRA, um, the assessment should be open to community input, including an appeal process for the community to, um, to go through, and that such appeal should allow for conditions to be required of the banks to improve their performance in key areas over a limited time frame. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we again have a large panel, and we are going to go with uh, an eight-minute round of questions. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Brownstein. Thank you. Um, my first question I wanted to address, um, first of all, to Alan, and then if anybody else wants to comment, feel free. It's kind of a two-parter. Um, Alan, in your testimony, your written testimony, and you mentioned it briefly in your uh, statement, you talked about the assessment area definition. And you um, put forward an idea that's been put forward in other CRA hearings we've had previously where banks should be responsible for areas where they do, and I think you use the term significant amount of business. I was wondering, the first part is, could you put some, you know, kind of definition on what do you mean by significant? How should we define that if we went in that direction? And then the second part is, do you have any concern at all, or anybody up there, that if we went in that direction, that it would cause banks to pull back from some areas where they're currently doing business because they're going to, you know, if they get close to that threshold where all of a sudden they're responsible for the area, they may pull back from that area altogether because they don't want that responsibility. So is that, are you concerned about unintended consequences of moving in that direction for assessment areas? And what do you consider significant? Those are the two parts. I, I mean, I think it's a very complicated question, and I put significant because I don't know the answer to that. It seems like we need to look at some examples and, and really see. But uh, it seems to me it's clear about the one branch bank or the Internet bank. Um, it's clear to me that I was thinking the unintended consequences you were asking was different, that maybe for a large retail bank there'd be unintended consequences because they gave less where their branch areas were and gave more outside. But I think all of those things are good questions that, that really need to be examined and by looking at practical examples and, and seeing. I think it is clear that branches are not the place that banking takes place in the way it did in 77. And I think the other things, you know, we'd really like to be part of a discussion that looked at examples and, and tried to, to be better at assessing that. And I'm sorry for not a good answer. Well, you know, it is difficult questions, and mm -hmm. that's why I'm asking, since yeah. you put it forward, if you had some idea of, I, I guess what you're saying is we're all smarter than you are, so we can figure this out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think that goes without saying. Um, but I think we'd really need to investigate it, and we haven't, and really work at it, and not kind of throw out some, you know, some number, because I think they... The end of it that, that deals with retail banks, like you're saying, it could have unintended consequences in a number of ways. If I might, if I might um, just as years ago, branches and deposits, where you, you, got, you garnered them from, were the indicator of you know, investment in a community. As Alan has said, that has completely changed with technology. 
Now it's more of a question of business services and lending being done in the community. And I think that any state where there's a bank uh, is lending more than $10 million should be part of the bank's assessment area. In addition to your second question, um, the fact is a bank is, uh, a financial institution is lending in a, in a you know, within a, in a, an area, within a community because it's profitable. You know, they're, they're, you know, they, they're outside of maybe their um, assessment area because it is profitable. And it will be profitable to the next bank who might be able to do the same bit of business. So, I don't, you know, I, 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 as long as it is profitable business, the banks are not going to back, back away from it simply because it, it now becomes part of their assessment area. And I think Alan's answer at the end was uh, quite appropriate. I do think this is, lends itself to more discussion. I think inherent within your, in your response is that you recognize that uh, institutions will game the system no matter where you draw that line. Um, and to the extent that California Reinvestment Coalition and other entities recognize gaming the system when one has one office in one state and one assessment area and serves the rest of the country, that to a certain extent a certain amount of gaming is going in terms of the business plan. To the extent that the regulators, uh, we believe, should also be able to recognize this. And I think people sitting around a table and honestly pursuing this will be able to come up some, with some way uh, to be able to address, I think, the concerns that we have about banks being able to escape any type of accountability uh, by gaming the systems in such a blatant manner as has, has been described. That's okay. Okay. Um, I've heard a couple of people on this panel and we heard a number of uh, persons on the previous panels talk about something called an innovative product. I have a very limited period of time. I'm going to ask each one of you to give me an example in your opinion, of an innovative product, and then the follow-up question after you've all gone through is, give us some suggestions as to how we as regulators can greater incentivize the entities we regulate to offer those kinds of products. I'll start with you, Mr. Berrigan. I think EQ2, uh, Equity Equivalent Investments, was an innovative product. It has become less so as fewer institutions are doing them in such a way that uh, provides for less strain and obligation on the nonprofit organization. I'll give an example. U.S. Bank last year, uh, in, in, the, in the midst of the credit crunch, made uh, $2 million available to us to do micro lending throughout Southern California. It was to a, businesses or To small businesses and okay. micro businesses. Small businesses and micro businesses. And at that time, back in October of last year, if you can remember, it was, um, un, you could not find the, those dollars, particularly and also targeted at small businesses. The fact is it was a very short process. It was at, at um, uh, supportive uh, interest rates and responsibility and allowed us to get, you know, and to date we pretty much have lent that entire $2 million out to small businesses throughout the territory. Over time, equity-like investment has taken on different definitions. But at the end of the day, what it should be is a long-term, below-market interest rate, non-recourse loan to a nonprofit CDFI to make um, uh, loans um, where financial institutions, for whatever reason, um, cannot make them. Mr. Williams. I think by definition an innovative product is something that is very effective. I think all too often we're looking for bells and whistles. To me, as I begin to look at the data and the needs in low-income communities in order to access uh, financing, access credit from financial institutions, I find that one of the major impediments going forward are uh, low credit scores and, and terrible credit behavior. It would seem to me then that the ability to implement fina uh, effective financial education, I was glad to hear Bank of America say that uh, sending out loan officers or sending out bank personnel just to show up to various classes uh, to talk about uh, financial education is not necessarily as effective as it is when they use financial intermediaries in the community. To the extent that we want to make capital available in low-income uh, low uh, communities, communities of color, Unless we deal with the issues of credit behavior and credit scores, we're not going to overcome those barriers. Therefore, something as simple and executed well, such as financial education, could be extremely innovative without necessarily having all the bells and whistles that we usually come to describe, come to uh, see 
as being innovative. Mr. Fisher. Yes, um, thank you. So I think of an innovative product as something that brings more people into the financial mainstream. Um, one example of that, one California bank uh, in Oakland has an essential bank account. It's a checklist checking account. You get free money orders and you have a card that can be used at point of sale and ATM. So it's very difficult to overdraft. And it kind of, it replaces and competes with the check casher. So I think that is a, is a good example. Incentivizing, I'm a little uncomfortable in some ways with that there ought to be some recognition, but that many of the things I think of are things that, you know, should be a matter of course and not seen as a huge change. I'm suggesting incentivizing in terms of incentivizing institutions to perhaps spend the kind of time that you've had mm -hmm. in coming up with these products, identifying the community, identifying the product, the service, whatever it is they want to provide, and to then carry it out. That's, that's where the incentive comes from. Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I've got two points. One is a quick example of many of the partners in the room today from the financial institutions can tell you about loan products that they had for home mortgages prior to about two or three years ago that were specifically tailored for low-income families with reduced FICO scores and reduced down payment assistance, that kind of a thing. Um, which kinds of things been, Mr. Williams is referring to or exactly. perhaps not as far? Perhaps even further, really. I okay. think that there were quite a few that no longer exist today, but the record shows that those homeowners did not default at a higher rate than most others. So it would be a return back to really finding a way to make sure that those people who are not accessing products today can access them. The other is really just making sure that you're ahead of the curve today. We know that green investments are sort of at the top of everybody's mind, and yet we want to make sure that we're not coming back to the table five years from now and saying something else is what where all of the money is coming in and all the investments coming in, and we need to rewrite CRA to allow for that kind of adaptation from the, from the banks. Thank you. Ms. Lane. I'm not sure if it's innovative, but uh, it, it is asking the bank to take a leadership role in addressing the um, borrowing needs of nonprofit um, affordable housing developers. I think the banks could um, take the lead in coordinating with foundations, doing uh, program investment, and local cities to provide acquisition loans, working capitals, and um, other risky loan investment up front to cover the cost of uh, starting these projects because the one of the most challenging um, aspect of trying to get this early money is that the banks are only willing to put in 60 maybe 70 percent and then the rest the nonprofit has to cobble together from other sources to have a one-stop shop where different um, partners come in to cover different tranches of risks would be a, um, a service that is much ne needed. Okay. Ms. Prinster. Well, I'd like to, uh, I, I did mention uh, one thing in my testimony, right. but before I do that, I, I, before I go to that, I'd like to just uh, piggyback on what Roberto was saying about EQ2s, um, and actually the two, two items are related in terms of the loss reserves. Um, one of the issues I think that has seemed uh, unfair to me is the expectation that and it's a reasonable expectation that those EQ2s, that those banks would always be whole on those EQ2s. And yet, they're at, by virtue of the, um, the relationship, we're being asked to make loans that are more risky than a bank would make. And so um, there needs to be some recognition that at some point there, there would be some either sharing or write down of those EQ2s that would be acceptable and that wouldn't prevent us from um, well, prevent the bank from having any kind of criticism or uh, us from ever even having a hope of getting another one in the future. Um, at, so the whole issue of loan losses is, is, is a concern for a nonprofit. You mentioned cobbling together the resources. Uh, here we are asking to, having to go out and try to raise contributions for equity to cover loan losses. Who wants to give money for that? Um, the other, the, the program that we have in Colorado has uh, included CDFIs as part of this um, loan loss reserve program, Colorado Credit Reserve. And as we look forward and project in the future and how it's going to help us um, to, to be a more financially sustainable 
uh, organization for the long term by, by helping us to cover the losses. It's, it seems to be a great program. It's really done a lot to uh, leverage resources. Uh, we have to still be responsible because we don't want to use up our whole reserve um, on a few loans. And it seems like a great thing that um, putting together a variety of resources to build up these reserve pools would, would uh, help CDFIs uh, greatly. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I'd like to uh, ask about uh, the panel's views on uh, CRA performance ratings and incentives. Uh, Ms. Ling, in your uh, written testimony, you recommended uh, uh, more grades, and I think a, uh, uh, you specific, specified an outstanding plus rating. I was wondering if uh, you could elaborate on that and, and any other ideas you may have in adjusting our rating uh, system. And uh, as part of your response, to what extent uh, uh, in this uh, uh, picks off of what Director Bowman was talking about. You know, what, what are the uh, appropriate incentives or that uh, we can use uh, through the rating system to encourage uh, lending and other commitments uh, by banks? Well, um, I think that Sharon Lee and the Low Income Housing Institute in Washington would like to see more weight be given to um, multifamily housing lending um, over uh, single family loans. So that's one area where that, that the Pacific Northwest is looking to um, weigh the uh, performance, the CRA performance differently. Um, that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Visa? I think part of the concern comes from the fact that as community advocates and as community members, when we see, I think we, we mentioned today, 99% of all banking institutions passing their CRA exam and a large percentage receiving outstandings, it's hard for us to differentiate between good, better, and the best. And I think that's where the outstanding plus rating comes into play. It's really differentiating between those extraordinary efforts that have been taken and just meeting the bar. Um, we would recommend that there actually be a sort of like a curve in school where only that top five or top 10% can receive an outstanding plus, and then there tends to be more of a collaboration and or competition among the field as well. I think a lot of the discussion yesterday in the earlier panel about the community development test comes into play here when we talk about incentives. Really allowing for those opportunities for for new ways to, to meet community needs to get to that next level. And I think one aspect that cannot be forgotten is what Alan mentioned, which is the community itself and their voice, trying to find a way to have their assessment be part of the, pro the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fisher. Well, these are great questions. Um, you know, we used to have a, um, a section of our newsletter, the bad dog section, where anyone that got less than a satisfactory was in there. And we've, there has been no one in California for years. And I, I think we, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with some of you about uh, great inflation, and and so I do think that maybe one possible thing just to add. I mean, I, I've always liked the idea of a curve after not liking it too much as a student, um, but the, to bring community development up to a higher level, not as sort of extra credit, but as as an intimate part of what happens. So I would think that and. And I, I go back and forth on the issue of incentives because certainly um, incentives help, but but this is supposed to be the business. Um, but maybe there are awards or something like that that recognize without being more than that. And and I do think that that banks of a certain size should be expected to get an outstanding. You know that if they don't, there ought to be some negative aspect to it because they they should be able to. Thank you, uh, Mr. Williams. Yeah, I, I think that's question somewhat overlaps with the discussion this morning. I think uh, an area of evaluating banks uh, ought to be how well they play together in regards to the CRA. All too often um, the issue of um, banks unwilling uh, are unable to come together to work on place-based, community-based needs as identified under uh, the performance uh, context uh, is hurting. Uh, a lot of nonprofits and the work that we do. All too often, um, a bank is only interested if they are there, they have their name on this project, uh, they get to brand it, they get to the credit, they're the lead. 
whereas we're likely to get better results if we can find them working in a collaborative manner. Now, the only way that's going to happen is you're going to have to give them credit and you're going to have to incentivize them in working together in an environment other than just multi-bank uh, CDCs. So to the extent that you can bring more resources together working on some of these problems where it's not necessarily looked at as being competitive or proprietary, I think the communities will be far more benefit, benefit uh, they will benefit far more. Thank you. Mr. Barrican? Um, actually, I have a unique, I have a unique um, position here. Um, I serve on the bank, on a community a bank board of directors. It's about a $500 million bank located in Encino that was just went through their CRA exam with the FDIC. I also serve as the chairman of the CRA committee. So I have a very unique position looking at how you evaluate us. This is a bank that did receive an outstanding rating. It commits 10% of net income to charitable contributions. It provides significant small business development lending and low moderate income census tracts. It um, makes investments in low-income credit unions and in minority-owned banks. It has significant participation in government lending programs, and it relies little on mortgage-backed securities and tax credits for CRA credit. That, I think, is an outstanding rating. I don't see that with many banks. <coughs> Ms. Prince. Well, being, being the last in line again, um, <laughs> which is great, I like that. <laughs> um, I guess what I was, I was just kind of uh, taking some notes here and uh, I, I came up with four items that from the previous <coughs> commenters uh, that start with the C, so maybe this will just summarize the, the comments here. Uh, community development test, I think, is a great idea. Uh, conversation with the community, uh, having that discussion uh, in an open and transparent way when there are exams um, with community stakeholders. Collaboration with each other is, is a great principle to, um, to try to evoke in, as, as part of the process. And uh, I like the idea of contributions. Um, just be 10% or whatever percentage, some kind of percentage of profits uh, contributing to things that will help community development, such as the technical assistance that we've been talking about um, and other uh, types of services that CDFIs, for example, but other community resources and nonprofits could also contribute to um, building up capacity in low and moderate income neighborhoods and populations. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to return to a question that uh, I asked the last panel because I, I think it's kind of given a little different flavor in the in the comments a number of you have made, and that was that in the in the last discussion that we had in thinking about things like small business lending, or foreclosure prevention and neighborhood stabilization, there is a it seems to me a certain tendency in thinking about how to deal with those issues, especially in the current economic climate to kind of broaden the base, to think about doing more things in small business that perhaps loosen links to a narrow definition of low and moderate income, uh, whereas a number of your comments were rather specifically focused not just on LMI communities but on minority communities and, and that sort of thing. It seems to me that those are kind of tensions pulling in opposite directions, but I just wonder if you see a real tension there or whether those are kind of reconcilable thoughts. I, I, I can say that at lunch we discussed that tension uh -huh. um, and for certain groups. I, I think to the extent that you start moving um, the CRA into uh, outside of, say, LMI communities, um, there are going to be issues. Um, I, to be somewhat facetious, um, uh, some of the comments were those those issues now being brought upon for middle and upper income folks are issues directly related to behavior by the banks themselves. And therefore now to go out to solve those and to get credit for them, you see it's sort of a, a circle kind of logic here that's not quite understandable. I think that notwithstanding the fact that the Community Reinvestment Act does not necessarily speak to race, anyone who studies the history of uh, redlining and Community Reinvestment Act knows that 
the silence in, the, in regards to race uh, was not the fault of those folks who were advocating for a CRA. It was the banking community that wanted to keep it out. That being said, uh, we know to, to the extent that we find low uh, income, high unemployment, all the indicators, we're going to find people of color. Therefore, uh, unless and until, and when we look at the demographics in terms of the growth in this country, the future labor force, these are the issues that we're facing. The future of this country is going to depend upon the growth in Hispanic, um, Southeast Asian, and African American communities. White population is decreasing. We all know this. Who is going to support Social Security? Who are going to fill those jobs out there necessary? We know that they can only be filled from those populations. Those populations are suffering from higher dropout rates, education, lack of access to capital, and what have you. So it would seem to me as a priority, looking at the scarce resources that we're addressing, that we must stay concentrated and we must stay focused. And if that focus is on low, moderate income communities at this point in time, and if that's the back door that I get into those populations, then so be it. Because I don't think that I'm going to be able to go to Congress and get them to open this up on the basis of race. So the way I look at this, uh, yes, there will be some tension if we try to move the CRA beyond the targeted low, moderate income communities. At some level, I, mean, I would trade Reg B for LMI. If, I could, you know, if, we, if we could actually determine what businesses were receiving, what communities were receiving loans, and that became the standard. The fact is, is, as Lauren said, our workforce is a very diverse workforce. I mean, the businesses that I work with, I don't bring them in because they're LMI. I bring them in because they're business. I do find out afterwards that the majority of the people they're hiring are LMI. And at the end of the day, it's about jobs. I, th I think when it, it I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, when I think when it comes to uh, small business lending, uh, there does need to be a recognition that small businesses are not necessarily place-based um, in terms of the LMI characteristics. I think there, as as Roberto was was talking, I think we also look at whoever uh, is lacking access to capital and find and find out later uh, what their profile looks like. And there's no question that. Um, low-income and moderate-income neighborhoods and communities need to have viable small businesses. But when, when it relates to LMI individuals who are business owners, they don't necessarily, the best place for their business is not necessarily in that community or that neighborhood. Um, so to, to the extent that you want to be able to uh, build wealth among those individuals, they have to go where the business concept is going to be most viable. On the other hand, it goes the other way, that maybe a, a middle income or even a higher income person who uh, might be starting a business that would be hiring uh, individuals from those, from those populations, uh, they themselves would not necessarily be um, LMI, nor would their business be of a certain size that would, um, that would qualify for CRA, and yet they would have a, a large impact on the community. So that's why I feel like the small business is really a, a little bit different, needs to be looked at differently in terms of the, um, the oversight and the, the incentives uh, to, to be able to see how it impacts the community. I'm not prepared to uh, represent the Low Income Housing Institute's point of view on this matter, but personally, I feel that this distinction between low income and community and uh, community of color is, is, a, is a false one. And I would tend to agree with Mr. Williams' um, 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 point of view that uh, let's focus on um, low and moderate income community and, um, and address the uh, social equity issues that these communities are seeking to uh, redress at this time. I agree with all of my colleagues here on the panel that there must be a focus on the LMI communities, but I think that we'll be doing ourselves a great disservice if we are race neutral. We see the, the research is startling that homeowners with a 720 FICO score and above were still disproportionately sold high cost predatory loans within the African American and Latino communities. And if we don't take that into account, 
when we're talking about CRA, I think we'll just end up in the same place once again. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with what my colleagues here are saying. I think it, but I, I think it has to be a mix of both of these things. It's, it's clear that there's color discrimination. I mean, in, in all the studies that we've done, the recent study we did looking at both loan modification and mortgage lending, um, areas where people of color lived were disadvantaged. Um, in the study we did a few years ago, middle-income African Americans had a harder time getting a mortgage loan than low-income Anglos. So I think we, we need to look at those kinds of things. I think we need more data around um, breaking out in terms of particularly Asian Americans, API. Um, but I, I think this has to be looked at, otherwise we don't get the whole picture. Thank you. Do others have uh, follow-up questions? We have a little more time. Um, okay, I can, I'll ask uh, one. This is, um, I, we had some discussion about this earlier today, and I wanted to get an opinion from people on this panel. Um, the needs assessment that's done as part of CRA requirements, you know, currently the responsibility is on the banks to do that. And um, there's been a lot of discussion about this at previous hearings. And some have said that um, they think that the regulators should be more actively participating in doing needs assessments, if not doing it all together. And um, we had some discussion about this on one of the panels. It was kind of split. Some of it was, yeah, the regulators have more data. They would be able to do it better. But then there were some concerns about that might interfere with whatever conversations currently go on between the banks and the community groups that would kind of let them off the hook. I was just wondering what's your, you know, what's this panel's take as community folks on the whole question of who should be doing the needs assessments? I feel, I feel strongly that, uh, I think I just mentioned that the banks do not know their communities. They should be punished in terms of their uh, rating. Um, I don't know how you get around this, but performance context um, is a place-based and even region-based kind of things. I think uh, one of the issues that we have is we have a lot of banks that are statewide or even throughout the United States and have a tendency to design products that fit in a national or a statewide platform. When in a state like California, the difference between Imperial Valley, the difference between Santa Cruz, the difference between Fresno and Sacramento are like four different states. We could further segment that down into, you know, even more than that. Uh, to the extent that those people were on the ground and in those communities, they have to know their communities. At one time, and I know we always talk about going back to old-fashioned banking, bankers knew about transportation issues. It's not just about low-income housing. It's not just about whether it's small business lending. We know the relationship between tra poor transportation, poor health within our communities and having negative impacts uh, within our communities that bankers are trying to address with the CRA. If the people on the ground and in these institutions do not understand the complexities and the needs of their community, again, I say they should be punished. Now, to the extent that the Federal Reserve were to go out and to provide data, that's almost like telling me as a lender, uh, a borrower has gone out and hired a consultant to do his or her business plan, and then I'm going to make a loan to that borrower who still may not necessarily understand that business plan because it's nice and fancy because they've got a consultant who's been able to put together some great data. So I tend to look at this as being a primary responsibility of financial institutions to understand and know the performance, uh, the context of their community and how they should be performing in, in that community uh, within the uh, needs that they have. Um. I think that the banks should continue doing the assessment, but I think those assessments should be evaluated and judged adequate by the regulators, not simply accepted as part of a, of, a, of a plan or a performance. And in fact, if the assessment itself is flawed, that it should inform the regulators as to the bank's uh, you know, uh, CRA performance. 
No, so that you, there, there's, both need to be part of the process. I, a bank should know what the committee looks like, but because of what they say, it should not be accepted as fact. Um, I guess I would agree that the, the banks should be the primary, uh, should have the primary responsibility for this because they are and should be closest to the community and what the needs are. Um, I think that uh, having that, having access to data um, is one thing. Interpreting the data is another thing. And interpreting it in the light of um, uh, non-quantifiable factors is also um, something that is, can only be done if you live in the community. So just because there's data doesn't mean that the interpretation of the data is going to be um, the same in every, in every community. And so um, I think that that's why it's important to have the banks do that. Uh, having, having access to the data that maybe, maybe the regulators would have is, um, is really critical. And they have, if there's more capability on the part of the regulators to provide the data, um, great. But uh, I do think it should be the responsibility of, of those who are closest to the community, which would be the banks. The uh, Lower Cobb Housing Institute um, recommended that the um, individual bank performance assessment should be open to community input. And I think that's where the um, regulators' um, participation and needs assessment could um, happen. Because through a community input process, you can determine whether um, a community's needs are being addressed and through an appeal process to put in conditions that would um, include um, the bank, um, you know, improving those areas where the community needs um, are, are still not being met. I think we, from my point of view, we need a sort of check and balance. I mean, our goal at CRC is not to have great CRA programs at the banks, but to have the banks internalize those programs, see them as good business, and move forward with them. So I think the critical thing is for the bank to really understand and take it on. But I think if we've learned anything in the last five or ten years, it's that once in a while banks game the system and may not tell us the whole truth. So I think there needs to be a role for the regulators to really oversee that, maybe using the community to be sure that what's happening is real and is really benefiting the community. Um, I mean, here, here in California, we have all these banks now that come in from out of state. They see our big state. They see an ability to make lots of money. And they think it looks like Minnesota or New York or North Carolina or something, you know. And they don't really understand, you know, what goes on here, the diversity, the, the size of it. I mean, maybe we have eight regions here, you know. The, this state is the size of most of the East Coast. So they think it's one, you know, it's like Rhode Island or something, you know. It's a state. So I think without there being some pressure from other places, there can't be a good assessment. I would just add to that that uh, regardless of who's doing the needs assessment, it's critical that the community input be, number one, either in the front end where they're providing the input for the needs assessment or on the back end where they're able to provide oversight and either agree or amend the assessment once it's created. We are a few minutes ahead. Any final? Okay, we are we are going to be moving on to the uh, a very large round of, of commenters. Uh, I know a comment was made by Mr. Fisher earlier about uh, keeping the, the record open. There is an opportunity for public comment to be added to the record through the end of the month. Uh, so we uh, we do welcome additional comments. Uh, I'd like to thank this panel for uh, their contribution. Uh, we will adjourn for uh, just over 15 minutes. Uh, we ask the speakers in this final session to uh, be in place by five minutes to three so that we can get started. We have quite a, quite a large number to get through. Thank you.